There's a saying in, in finance, there is no return without risk, okay? Which means that if you want to make a return, you have to take a risk. And if you take a risk, you could lose your money, but you could also make a lot of money. Now most uh, people trying to sell you um, investments, which aren't sensible investments, will pretend you can make a ton of money without taking any risk. There are lots of books written about how you can make billions investing. And the truth is, it's impossible to do that. There are very, very, very few people who've made their money purely on investing. Of course, those are the people uh, books are written on, but it's not something the average person can do easily. So no return without risk is one way of saying uh, be careful where you invest your money because anybody promising you a high return probably implies you have to take on a high risk. Most of us are ambitious and we have career goals in mind. We think we'll be happy if we are successful. Remember hearing that earlier? Uh, we, we will be happy if we become CEO of a multinational corporation or if we win the Nobel Prize, or become a mega movie star, and so on. And to achieve these goals, we sometimes take jobs we dislike, for we think the pain will be worth the eventual gain. When we reason like this, I believe we have causality backwards, exactly what she said. You're rarely happy simply because you're successful, but you're much more likely to be successful if you're happy doing work you enjoy. So when you choose what to do, don't focus on the end point. Instead, focus on whether you like the work itself. Not only will you be more likely to reach your goal, even if you don't arrive at that end point, you'll have had an enjoyable life. But remember, as your teachers have already told you, and as our culture suggests, the achievement of narrow personal goals, greater wealth, rapid promotion, or increasing fame, rarely brings you anything other than brief pleasure. I don't claim to know the secret of happiness, but this seems obvious. If you like the journey, if you get pleasure from the work you do, it matters far less when, or indeed whether, you reach the destination. You have far more control over the journey you choose as Ms. Narayan also told you. And often the most enjoyable journeys are those where your goals are broader and we, where you take others with you. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You've heard that being said? Jimmy Carter, the former American president, used to say that often. That means that if you want anything in life, you have to work for it. You have to work pretty hard for it. If somebody is giving you a free lunch, it means there's something they want from you. They may not tell you up front, but once you've had the lunch, they'll present the bill. So point again is there's no such thing as a free lunch. Can't get something for nothing. In this world, everything is metered. Yes, you can get something for nothing from your parents. But your parents are looking at you as, you know, with love, with, uh, uh, with a lot of pride, and probably also because you continue their genes into the world. That's, that's the reason nature makes parenthood so, uh, such, such a good thing. So I'm going to derive some lessons for, from this. But before I talk about what you can take away, let me caution you about questioning everything, including my interpretation of Sandal because only with questioning comes clarity. So long as you have a long enough horizon, buy a diversified portfolio of stock, you'll get a reasonable return on the market. Okay? But it's important to remember stocks are just one part of your investment. You can also invest in bonds, in fixed deposits, in real estate, in art, and typically what people would say is, 
hold a diversified portfolio. Sometimes stocks go down. But when stocks go down, your fixed deposits don't go down. Your fixed deposits provide a return. But because they're fixed and they provide a reasonable return most of the time, they don't provide you the high returns that stock markets could sometimes provide. So hold a portion of your portfolio in stocks. When the stock market does well, you'll feel really good. But hold a portion in, in fixed deposits because when the stock market goes down, you can at least pay for your food and you're not out on the street. Don't load up on any one thing, even though you're a sure return. And again, go back to there are no sure returns, right? So um, diversification is really extremely important, is really the only thing that makes sense over time. Because you as busy individuals not you know, having to do a lot of work as you graduate and go and become lawyers and engineers and, and entrepreneurs, you're focused on real activity. You don't have time to study the stock market. Some of you will do it as a hobby. But in general, making money there is very difficult. And so better to hold a diversified portfolio. But be diversified. The problem in India is too many people hold very narrow portfolios. Your parents, for example, many of them didn't bother to hold stocks. I should say your grandparents. They invested in fixed deposits, most of them. And as a result, haven't made the kind of returns they could have made if they'd invested in a broader stock portfolio and benefited from the growth in stocks during the period of liberalization. What is important in all this is returns are compounded. And that's something to remember. The power of compounded returns over time, some of all of you know what compound interest is, that you get 10% this year, next year you get 10% on the 10%. So next year it's 21% or uh, you know, the, uh, the value of your, your um, assets goes up 21% from the initial year. So the point here is that compounding can take you a long way if you invest sensibly in a diversified way, uh, hold a diversified portfolio. Let me give an example. How do you sell a refrigerator in India? in the villages. Now, that seems like a silly question. Well, sell the same old refrigerator that you have in the villages. Well, the problem in the villages is electricity comes for only nine hours a day for the villages that have electricity. And it doesn't come the same nine hours. It is randomized because they cut off electricity whenever the, the lines go down, whenever they, have, whenever they have too little power. So how do you run a refrigerator when you don't know when the electricity is going to come? That's the problem that Godridge engineers had to figure out. Godridge is a refrigerator company. So they went to the villages and queried these people, you know, what do you use a fridge for? And uh, what they learned was what the villager wants the fridge for is cooking the food in the morning, keeping it cool over the day, and being able to eat that same food in the evening, making sure it doesn't spoil. In other words, they wanted to cook once a day, like many of us. We don't want to cook three meals a day. Um, in India, of course, during the day the sun is very hot, you want the refrigerator to keep the food from spoiling during that time. They also discovered these people didn't need ice. They didn't want ice. They wanted food cool. They didn't care if it didn't make ice. Well, that was the answer. Because once you know the refrigerator doesn't need to make ice, you know you don't need to cool it below zero. If you cool it to six or seven degrees centigrade, that's fine. That keeps the food from spoiling. Once you need to cool it only to six or seven degrees centigrade, you don't need a compressor. You can do with a fan. And they've built fan-cooled refrigerators which can, wow, which can work off a battery, which don't need to work off the mains. So when the electricity comes, the battery recharges. When the electricity goes off, the battery works and powers the refrigerator, so you've got 24-7 power from the, from the refrigerator. But that refrigerator is now cheaper than the refrigerator which works off a compressor because it is working according to the technology, uh, according to the needs of the villager. And so the market has expanded many fold. That's the kind of frugal technology that I think increasingly is emerging. And it is not just companies there. It is multinational companies like GE which are thinking about how they're going to service that market. Now, I think that's very, very important, very useful, but it also implies an enormous change 
for industrial country companies.